When we have a number of different columns, each variable within that data set, each column is going to have a completely different range. Consider examining data from a set of students. We might have a GPA variable, which will have a different range than, say, their GMAT score. They may have other variables like the distance to school, IQ, number of clubs joined. They're all going to have different ranges. Therefore, in many cases, if we want to compare one variable to another, we will need to normalize this in order to understand the variables and how they move around their mean, and thus standardize the effect of the movement of the variables. In min-max normalization, we're comparing a vector to its minimum value and scaling the value based on the range. So thus, the minimum value in a vector would be 0, and the maximum value will be 1. All other numbers will be between 0 and 1. How do we obtain this? So consider we have the following formula. xi, which stands for a particular observation, subtract the minimum, and we divide by the range. Let's rewrite that a little bit. xi, which is the observations, minus the minimum. Divide it by the maximum minus the minimum. So that denominator is our range. If we have any value, let's take a minimum value of 10. Our data set goes from 10 to 100. The minimum is 10. If our observation that we're looking at is 10, that's the xi, and we subtract the minimum, which is 10, then the numerator will be 0. And thus, this new observation will have a normalized value of 0. If, however, our maximum value is 100, and we look at an observation that's 100, we end up with the xi being the maximum. And if we look at it that way, we have maximum minus minimum, which is the same as the denominator. And so therefore, that would be 1. So our 100 as the observation would be equivalent to 1 in our data set. Everything else falls in between. So all numbers will be between 0 and 1. Now, we have a function called minmax normal, which is available on the blog site as well if you'd like to use. You can also use other packages that have the minmax normal as well. But as an example, here we have our iris sepal length. We're going to take the first 10 values. And from here, what we'll do is we'll have the numbers 5.1, 4.9, 4.7, 4.6, 4 and so forth. By using the minmax normal function that we provide, putting that same value in, it basically takes each one of those items, figures out the minimum and the maximum, and then it will give you a new value for each of the observations. So here you can see that all the way to the right, the 4.4 is equivalent, once it's normalized, to 0, because that's the minimum. And in the middle, where the 5.4 is, that's the maximum, and it has been converted into a 1. And all other numbers fall between the 0 and 1. Now, another way to rescale our data is to do standardization. If we have a sampling distribution that is approximately normal, we can create a standardized value using this formula here. We have each observation, xi, and we subtract the mean. And we divide by the sample standard deviation. This will give us what's known as a z-score. The scale data function in R will provide these standardized scores of a vector. But what does this z-score actually mean? Well, consider that we have an observation that is in the middle, that is basically equivalent to our mean. Then the numerator here becomes 0. And so the z-score is 0. And if you look here on the chart, right at the middle, at the bottom, it gives us what our z-scores would be. And in this case, that center point is 0. The bottom scale, or the bottom axis, actually refers to the number of standard deviations away from the mean. So if a number is at the mean, then the number of standard deviations would be 0. If we have other numbers, let's say negative 1, that would be one standard deviation away from the mean to the left. And if it was a positive one, it would be one standard deviation away to the right. So the z-score is actually a representation of the number of standard deviations away from the mean. Using our example before, we'll take that scale function in R and we'll pass in the first 10 items of the sepal.length from the iris data set and we get the numbers 0.82. That is 0.82 standard deviations away from the mean to the right side of the mean, because it's positive. So it would appear somewhere in this vicinity. 0.13 is closer to the mean, again, on the right side, so it would be a little bit closer to that zero. The negative 0.54 and negative 0.89 would be over to the left of the mean, 
and they stand for about a half a standard deviation away and almost one standard deviation away from the mean. The sixth observation here is 1.85, so that's a lot further away. That's almost two full standard deviations away from the mean on the right side. Now, if we have a data that's high, if we have a data, now, if we have a data set that's highly skewed or with some problems, we may need to transform the data. Why are we transforming it? Because we want to transform data and try and make it normal. And that can be done by some uh, computation, such as a log or raising to an exponent or something. And there are different transformations to try and get the data set to normal. And the reason we like normality is because we have a lot of different statistical methods that have an assumption of normality and they're very robust when we actually have normality, such as ANOVA, t-tests, and so forth. We must identify whether a data set is normal, which can be done graphically, but it's not very accurate for close to normal vectors or using a statistical test. So we need to determine whether a data set is normal, let's say graphically. So if we're going to determine whether a data set is normal, we can use a histogram and QQ plots. And if we're going to use statistical tests, we'll use Shapiro, Wilk, and Anderson Darling. But you should note there are a number of other tests that could be used for testing of normality. Let's look at a graphical assessment. So here what we've done is we've created two data sets in R using the R norm. So the R norm and REXP will produce a random set of data. In the first case, using a normal distribution, we're going to create 100 observations with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. In the second case, we are creating 100 observations using an exponential distribution with a lambda of 0.2. And this will go into our vector n1 and n2. Then we're going to graph them. So we're going to basically graph using histograms. So we use the hist function in R. Here we do hist n1 and hist n2. And it's represented by the two graphs up above. And we can see the first one definitely looks normal, and the second one doesn't look so normal. The QQ plot is a nice way to tell us where the observations lie along a theoretical line. So for example, we're going to create a QQ norm and a QQ line for each one of these. That solid line represents where the observations should lie. For a normal distribution, most of the data points should lie in the center with some slight deviations uh, at the tails. So in the first case, we see that this normal data, all of the observations pretty much lie on that line. You, know, you don't have too much deviation, and then you get to the tail, and at the top tail, you, it gets a little bit further away from the line. Now the bottom one for graph 4, which is the exponential QQ plot, again, we're trying to see if this is following a normal distribution. It gives us our line, which we should match up to, and we see a couple of problems. Number one is we see a problem where the center part here is actually fading away from the line and it seems to deviate a little bit. And it's really that you're seeing a gap there, and that's an indicative, that is indicative of a problem. The other problem is it seems to curl back towards the line. Now, in some normal distribution QQ plots, it will follow along the line and then tail off to the right, but it will never come back up, as it's doing here, and then come back to the line. The bottom portion is actually somewhat okay. You might see these tails start from the line and go to the left. So it will form an S-curve, but the left side will be a little bit away from the line, then it will follow along the line, and then it will go away from the line to the right. It will not go back up and then come back to the line as this graph is showing. So it takes a little bit of experience to read those graphs accurately and to know some of the nuances behind them. Now the statistical tests, which are some of the things that I prefer, uh, is to test the normality of a vector. We're going to do, use the same type of data set, and we're going to use two tests. We're going to use the Shapiro test and the Anderson-Darling test. We need to install a package called NORTEST in order to run the AD test, which is the Anderson-Darling. So here what we've done is we've actually run the values, and you get a little different output. We'll put it into a table for you. What we're looking for is to see if we're going to reject or not reject the null hypothesis. In both cases, the null hypothesis is that the data is normal and that the alternative hypothesis is that the data is not normal. So we're hoping, if we want a normal data set, that we do not reject the null hypothesis. So we're going to focus on the p-value. When we run the Shapiro test for N1, we can see that the p-value is 0.5679. So since it is greater than 0.05, we will not reject the null hypothesis. 
and we can state that we have evidence that the data is normal because we cannot reject the null hypothesis. In the case of N2, looking at Shapiro test, we have a p-value of 0 0.000003. Therefore, we will reject the null hypothesis because it is less than 0.05, and therefore we say that we have evidence that the data is not normal, and we might need to do a transformation. You'll notice that in the Anderson-Darling test, we're getting similar results. P-value for N1 is 0.51, so we will not reject the null hypothesis. And the p-value for N2 is significantly lower than 0 0.05, so we will reject the null hypothesis. Now, there are some nuances with each one of the tests, and that's why there are other tests as well. With Shapiro, it should be noted that you do have a maximum of 3,000 observations. It won't do more than 3,000. You do not have the same limit for the Anderson-Darling test.